Let's do it under the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Thank you. Thank you for all that hot air. Amen. And thank you for your kind words. Thank you for inviting me back to your wonderful district. And I give honor and, and congratulations to these two wonderful speakers, Brother White and my good man who just preached that wonderful message, wanting a way in. Wow. And last night, whew, Brother Fraser, that, that was just marvelous. That was marvelous. Amen. Now, I, I don't want to be rude, but I'm just, it just comes natural. Now, I watched these two or three guys preach their guts out to the living dead. And a handful of you went, well, that ain't going to happen with me. I start hot. You ain't going to worry. I don't warm up for nothing. I am hot. But I believe with all my heart, you need to be able to go to heaven from your last church service. <clears throat> And so I know Brother Fraser tentatively scheduled for tonight, and I'm scheduled for tomorrow night, but we may not make I come. Some, some fool might shoot us in a, in, a, in a McDonald's getting a hamburger. You, you don't know. So you can't save your best for later. Okay? So, so I thank you again. Brother Story, congratulations on your being a big kahuna. Glad you got voted in. Amen. I couldn't get voted in dog catcher in this movement. But I don't want to anyway, so it doesn't matter. So I'm reading now, and you're hearing, if you'd like to listen or follow along with me, I'm going from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 30. And, and, and I preach for a living. I really do. I preach for a living. And if it's not going good with me when I'm preaching, I'll just close my Bible and go home. Because I'm already famous. And so I, I just, I just want to help you. I feel like the Lord has spoken to me and given me a, a message, in fact, two messages back to back for this particular camp meeting. And uh, I know I'm on the internet. Am I on the internet now? All that antichrist junk, we're on all that stuff. Okay, so I'll probably get busted by headquarters in a few minutes. That's fine. Nevertheless, I'm reading 1 Samuel 30. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south of Ziglag, smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire, taking the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, neither great or small, carried them away, went on their way. David and his men came to the city. Behold, it was burned with fire. Their wives, their sons and daughters were taken captives. And David said, uh, Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept till they had no more power to weep. And David Two wives were taken captive, Ahinam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail. Now, that's an interesting thing. If you people do, you're a word study guy, fine. Do you understand that Ahinam and Abigail, one means grace and the other means joy? That went over like a lead balloon. Okay, let me try that. You got to understand, hell's after the grace in your life, and hell's after the joy in your life. And he stole them and they took them away. Well, and then he got really distressed because they talked about stoning him. Things have not changed in thousands of years. If it goes well, God gets the credit. If it goes lousy, let's beat up the preacher. That's just the way it works. But they tried to stone him because they were all upset about losing their kids. Well, David encouraged himself in the Lord. And David said to Abathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring hither the ephod. And Abathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, and thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. I've got to go fast. You've had enough preaching today to save the world. So I've got to go in and out of this chute real fast, okay? Here's what I felt the Lord spoke to me to tell you right now. To get back what you've lost, you've got to go back to what you left. 
Now that was too wussified for me. I'm going to try that again. To get back what you've lost, you got to go back to what you left. You don't need a new doctrine. You don't need a new teaching. You don't need any new revelations. You got enough stuff to take you to heaven right now. Lord, bless the teaching and the preaching. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you once again for the invite to be a part of this great district. I've been here numbers of times before. In fact, I saw Billy Stanley. Was Billy Stanley over there somewhere? He, him and I preached at Texas camp together many, many years ago. And I'm very glad to be with all of Brother Worley and all these guys that I've known. And the boy, you be a, you know, you Texans got some money in this district, man. That Worley, man, he, he lent money to the U.S. government. Man, that, I want to make a statement that, that'll sound offensive, but it's not. It's confrontational. In the book of 2 Kings chapter 3, here's, here's what I felt the Lord has put on my heart to help. I was going to preach this at General Conference, but as usual, I wasn't invited. I was going to preach it because of the times, but I've not been invited. So I'm going to preach it at Texas because I was invited. Okay? The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 3. Now you preachers, I appreciate you checking your pants and looking at everything. It's fine. Now you can get up off your rear end while I preach or I'm going to tell these people, don't listen to you. I'll tell you right now. Don't listen to a preacher who won't worship. You talked about the 11 that stood up with Peter. Preachers need to stand with preachers. And I wouldn't listen to a preacher trying to tell me how to live if he sat there like a bump on the log. Well, I'm going to try it again. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. We don't get any points for showing up. We get points for showing out. We get points for making a joyful noise under the Lord. I know it's not all in emotion, but it's not all in the sitting and staring either. Sit, sit down, sit down. I'm going to see if I can resurrect the dead here right now, right? Here's what the Bible said, 2 Kings chapter 3. And the king of Moab sought to break through the army and the line of of the troops of Israel, watch, and could not. God gave this to me. I didn't steal it from nobody. I don't, I'm the only guy in UPC don't own a computer. I don't own one. I don't own an iPad. I don't own an iPhone. I don't like all that junk that says I, 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 I. I don't, I don't like that Apple stuff. There's a bite out of that. That's trying to tell you where that spirit came from. Now, I'm not against it. You play with all your little antichrist toys all you want to. I don't need... I don't need any of that stuff. He's going to get you before he gets me. I, I don't mean to be rude, but I don't need the internet to get a sermon. I don't need the internet to get me a word from God. I got a Bible that's full of the virtues of God and the truths of God. I'm not against it. You do what you want, but I ain't doing that. Now, now stay with me because I'm going to try to resurrect the whole place at one time. Here's what it says. And the king of Moab, now I'm coming to you, bishop, and then I'm going to leave you alone. The king of Moab came and tried to break through and could not. So he took his son and slew him on the mountain. And if I ever heard the voice of God, God spoke to me and said, tell my people, if they don't hurry up and get a breakthrough, they're going to kill the next generation. If we don't have a breakthrough in the supernatural and the miraculous and the unexplainable, we are going to sentence the next generation to spiritual suicide. Stay, stay with me. Stay with me. You, you can sit down. You have to understand something. Our movement. Now, I'm on the internet. Okay. Our movement. This is what I felt the Lord said to me. Our movement is in danger of becoming a movement that doesn't want the supernatural. That we don't want divine interventions. That we don't want the Spirit of God to somehow take over because we lose control. The devil is a liar. That's how we got born into this thing. We need the moving and the operation of the Holy Ghost. We need things that happen in our church that we can't explain. I 
preach for a living, folks. I've, I've, I've crisscrossed this whole movement over the last 45 years. I'm telling you, now I don't want to hurt your feelings. If you're guilty of this, then get over it. But we got too many churches that don't ever have tongues and interpretation. Whatever happened to that? You can write off all you want to, but tongues is the voice of the bridegroom. And we need to hear the voice of the bridegroom. We need to hear God talking to us. We need God, woo, challenging us. Let me try it again. To get back what you've lost, you've got to go back to what you left. What did you leave? Maybe you left desperation. Maybe you left hunger. Maybe you left thirsting. Maybe you left determination. But we need to reach for the super. Now, I don't, I, I don't want you to misunderstand. You can't keep running your church by the supernatural and jumping up and down and run the aisles. You got to have doctrine. You got to have theology. You got to have teaching. But it ought to be combined with that. We're specializing in a movement that believes in doctrine but not demonstration. Let me help you with it. If you have doctrine and no demonstration, you produce frustration. If you have doctrine and a demonstration, you produce transformation. And that's what we need. We need the Word and the Spirit. Now, I don't, know, I don't know what you do here in Texas, but the kids in Gainesville, they've got this little cliche, this terminology. Sometimes you've got to bust a move. Now, I don't even know what bust a move means, but, but I can moonwalk. I can, I can invent. I'm excited about See, I've been in this all these years. I haven't got over this. I'm concerned that Pentecostal peoples have just settled down into this rut, and they're just used to it. Move me, preacher. Move me, choir. The devil is a liar. If you want God to move, you need to move. If you want God to act up, You've got to act up. Sit down, sit down a minute. I don't mean to keep looking at you preachers. It's just that I'm at war right now with this whole movement. This is my family. I'm not leaving. This is, this is my home. But I have a right. I've, I've given this movement over two and a half million dollars of my own money. Don't tell me I can't say something. This is my family. I was a hell raiser, a honky tonker, and a whoremonger, and a jailbird. And God snatched me out and brought me in this thing. This is the best thing I've ever had. But I'm not going to sit on the sidelines and just have this thing become just a doctrinal, theological bunch of junk. We got to have a divine interruption of the Holy Ghost. We got to start running aisles. We need to start talking in tongues. We need to have services where people fall down on the ground and you can't explain it. You just sit down. I'm so concerned that our movement is heading towards this situation where we do not want the supernatural interrupting our church services. Name of God. Didn't Jesus say, without me, you can do nothing? I don't want our movement or this district or my church family to turn around and say to God, you want a bet? We can build something without you. We can do it. Now, it may not be great and kind, but it'll be a nice little chief church junky stuff. We can build something without you. Yeah, but you can't cast devils out without me. You can't heal sickness without me. You can't get people off drugs. You can't get people set free from booze. You can't get people healed of emotional ruptures. You can't, whoa, you can't. And then I heard Paul said, but I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. If we get Jesus moving and acting in our services, we'll have stuff that'll blow this world apart. Say, 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 I'm, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm just, I'm just telling you, we, I, I'm an old buzzard. I know I am. And, and, and we've raised a generation now that knows about iPhone, iPad, uh, email. I wrote in my notes, I said, tell these people, God doesn't answer email. He answers an email. Now you laugh all you want to them. I'm an old buzzard. I'm still waiting for eight tracks to come back. Okay, but watch. I'm on the plane. I travel all the time. 
90% of the people on the plane. Almost 100% of the people in the Atlanta airport, I walk by and I start counting them. That is replacing reality. I'm not against you having a phone or an iPad, but that should not become a substitute for real relationships. And if we're not careful, stuff like that will become a substitute for the moving and the acting of the Holy Ghost. Please, please stay with me. I'm not trying to be rude. I, I just want to say to you brethren something. Listen to me. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, God gave me a revelation. Of I didn't steal it from a book. He gave it to me. He said, tell my people, if they don't let me move, I don't talk. You know the big difference between Pentecostal, apostolic, holy rollers and the rest of the world? It isn't just doctrine. It's that we let God move and God talks to us and God deals with us and God shows us stuff and God inspires us. Stay, stay, just stay with me for just a minute. I'm, I'm going as fast as I can. Paul warned the people in the last days that people would have a form of godliness and but deny the power thereof. I agree with what the Reverend said last night, Brother Frazier, that I believe in standards, I believe in modesty and morality, but that cannot become a substitute for reality of God. See, if you're not careful, you'll let that become a safety zone for you. Say, so, well, I don't smoke and I don't drink and I don't cuss and I pay my tithes and I don't watch too many dirty things and I don't read too many... But, that, but that's not it. It's like... When's the last time God decided to move on you? Do you know why we sit in the same seats every time we go to church? Because nothing happens there. You think, yeah, you think I'm crazy? I look crazy. I may need therapy, but I don't need yours. At our church, when things got bad, you you just disagree with me. That's fine. But I believe in tongues and interpretation. God's used me for years in that. I believe in interruptions. I believe in the power of prophecy. I believe in God just grabbing the hold and shaking the whole church and saying, I need to talk to you. And when our church services started getting locked up, and they do get locked up, the best do. They get locked up. But wait a minute. If the leadership doesn't get off, excuse me, off their caucus and get up to here and say, wait a minute, shut it down. We got to have God. God move among us. We're, we're just going through the ritual. We're going, we're clapping our hands, but that's nothing happening. Well, here, here's what I would do, Bishop. I would turn and sit down, sit down. I, I, I would take, I have like a half a dozen ex uh, uh, drug addicts and drug pushers. I mean, they were all just. <sighs> I get them out and say, okay, Wayne, I want you to go sit over in that congregation right there about the fifth week because that's where the living dead is bill i want you to go right over there and i'd i'd put out five or six of my spies among the living dead and i would tell them i said okay when i start preaching when i give you the signal you bust a move you just jump up and go hallelujah and so i it was a planned attack and i would just do it and i'd say glory to god yay and they would jump up Glory to God. How? And all those professional plastic Pentecostals sitting there going. And so I'm sliding down on the seat. And they're just busting a move and they're going crazy and saying, why are you doing that? Because it's not enough to just come to church. It's, it's not enough to just not do certain things. We got to have an operation of the Holy Ghost. Brethren and sistren, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves to say we believe a doctrine, but we don't have no demonstration. The Lord gave this to me, Bishop, and I'm not picking anybody up. I'm challenging myself. The Lord said, ask the people this question. When are you going to get sick and tired of people not getting healed? Oh, the Lord bless you, and you go on your way, and hallelujah. Oh, you chicken-livered sucker. You make me so sick. So why don't you? I'm getting to my message. You made me wait five hours. I'm getting to my message. <laughs> sit down, sit down. So the Bible says that, that David, 
have been living in Ziglag and they invaded the land and they took his wives and his kids and they stole all his stuff and stole all his trinkets and toys and he got devastated and he was scared half to death. Wait a minute. The reason he lost something was because he left something. You say, well, what did he leave? He left his trust in God. According to 1 Samuel 27, he got so tired and weary with that idiot Saul chasing him all the time. He said, there's nothing better for me to do than to escape to the land of Philistines, and then he'll get tired of me. What he just said was, I'm going to leave you being my Savior, and now I'll be my Savior. And when you choose to save yourself, you lose his action. Oh, I wish I had a witness on that. Yeah. If it's been a while since you felt the presence of God, or you've been a while since you heard His voice, you need to ask yourself, okay, I've lost that. What did I leave that caused that to happen? Did you leave, leave dedication? Did you leave joy? You know, I'd like to say this as kindly as I can, and I have to just emphasize as kindly as I can. The Lord gave me a thought and said, tell my people, joyless believers are an insult to my grace. For people that have no joy, and yet your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, yet your sins have been forgiven, you got a baptism of the Holy Ghost, you go into the city where the Lamb is alive, how could you possibly have no joy? You may not have everything going on in your life the way you want it, but you got joy, and the joy of the Lord is your strength. Please, 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 please be seated just, just for a second. I'm going as fast as I can. I, I, I need to say something that I say a lot of times, but you got to hear me. The promises of God are not self-fulfilling. I don't care what they say in the Bible school. I don't care what they say up at headquarters. I don't care what they say in all their foolish books. I don't give a flip. The promises of God are not self-fulfilling. The promises of God are revelation of divine intention. He goes on record and says, this is what I'm going to do. Then he steps back and says, now what are you going to do to make it happen? Remember, he turned around and he said, Shall I pursue? Let me tell you something. I'm sorry to keep preaching to you, Reb, but you need a good sermon. You ready? Watch. He said, shall I pursue? Shall I overtake them? Brother Fraser, he only asked two questions. God gave him three answers. He said, pursue. Thou shalt doubtless overtake them. Here it is. And without any problems, recover all. He didn't ask if he could recover all. He said, shall I pursue? You see, here's, here's what our problem is in our movement. You are never going to possess what you're unwilling to pursue. You can sit there all you want to and say, I believe this and I believe that. you got to go after it. The supernatural is not going to throw us down on the ground. The miraculous is not going to arrest us. we got to reach for it. we got to stretch for it. Because it's always just beyond your five senses. You'll never possess what you're unwilling to pursue. And you will never pursue until you're persuaded. It's available. Say, so sit down. I'm going faster. Am I doing good yet? No. Can't tell. Okay. Watch. I'll go over here. Watch. He said, shall I pursue? Shall I overtake? The Lord said, pursue. So thou shalt overtake and doubtless recover all. What? So he takes off chasing what he lost. He only lost it. Because he left his trust and confidence in God. He got so frustrated over the problem in his life, he decided he could fix it. Well, the Lord turned around and burned Ziglag to the ground to get him. You, you ready? This is so, now, come on, you preachers, I want you to just get happy right now. Ready? The Bible said he found them, and I didn't read the rest of it, it says, and they were dancing and singing and rejoicing over all the spoil that they had taken from the Philistines and from the Jews. Watch this. God showed me and said, tell my people, the enemy parties over your pain. He rejoices over what you've lost. That ought to make me so stinking mad and so angry that the adversary is laughing over what I've lost. Man, I'm coming. 
All right, let me try and tell you again. Here's what I'm preaching about. I want my stuff back. I want my stuff back. I want my joy back. I want my faith back. I want my determination back. I want my desperation back. I want my hunger and thirsting back. Whatever I let go of, I want it back because I have lost the power of God and I've lost the joy of God and I want to get it back. Sinner, I'm, I'm going as fast as I can. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You understand that Samson lost his anointing because he left morality. And he left telling the truth because he exposed his vow to that whore. She was a whore. She was a harlot. That's what she was, a harlot. Delilah was a harlot. And he's laying in the sack with her. Isn't it funny how people with anointing can be immoral? Look, he just looked at me and said, oh, no. He was anointed. And he was immoral. He had, the, he had the morals of a barnyard dog. And he's laying around with that cheap slut and just having a big time. Finally gets, his, gets a crew cut, turns around, violates his vow. When he does, he lost something that he didn't know he lost. Bible said he wished not that the Spirit of God had departed. That's the most dangerous thing for our life is to lose something from God and we're not even aware of it because you're not going to be aware of it until you need it. You don't need it when it's calm. You need it when there's a crisis. And when you're in a crisis, it ain't no time to get it. You got to already have it. You, you ready for this, Bishop? I'm sorry, I appreciate it. And, and they, cut his, they cut his hair off, gave him a crew cut, took his eyes out, put him, sit down, sit down, sit down, and uh, uh, put him in the dungeon grinding and binding, and his hair's growing longer, right, fine. But the Bible says they brought him out. Now, maybe you don't believe this. Maybe, I don't know, but too much internet. You need to read the Bible. Ready? Watch. It says, and he found a young lad, and he said to the young lad, Take me where the pillars are. Wow, what a revelation. Is God saying to the Pentecostal movement, we need to raise up a younger generation to help the older generation. The older guy could do some certain things, but the younger guy is what took him to the pillars. And when he got to the pillars, he said, now, Lord, remember me. I know I messed up. I know I lost my hair. I know I insulted you. I know I shamed myself. I know I reproached the kingdom of God. Lord, just somehow remember me and let me somehow get paid back for my eyes. And while he was there, what he had lost came back. I'm here to tell you, I don't care what you've lost and how long it's been gone. If you will return to the Lord, if you will get honest and naked and transparent before God, God will give you back what you have lost. Woo. Can, can, can. You, you can be seated. The Paul wrote to the church, talked about that last day having a form and no power. So I'll get to my story in Ziglag. This blows my mind. It just, here he is. David is he's crying. He's weeping. He's lost Ahinam and he's lost Abigail. He's lost all his trinkets and toys, his CDs, his 401ks. He's lost everything. And now his own family wants to kill him, his friends, his people. And he turns around and he says, and he encourages himself in the Lord. Now, this is powerful. Now, if you don't shout on this, it's because you're all Baptists. That's your problem. You're all Baptists is what you are. You're just loud Baptists. That's what you are. Watch. He said, and he inquired of the Lord. And he said, shall I pursue? Shall I overtake? Now, maybe you didn't see what he just did. He has been in Ziglag for 16 months. One year, four months. You ready? 150 Psalms. Not one Psalm was ever written while he was in Ziglag. You don't want to know why? God told me. I didn't steal it from some dumb book. God told me. Here's what he said. Tell my people, when you get into disobedience, the music stops. When you get into self-preservation, the songs stop. Now, maybe that doesn't do for you what it's doing for me. And I'm trying to go as fast as I can because I know you've been in here for, 
for hours, okay? Let me just go real quick. The Bible says, he said, can I pursue? Will I overtake? The Lord said, pursue, overtake, recover all. Watch. In one moment of going back, he overrode 16 months of nothing. In one moment right now, if you would admit you might have lost something or you left something go, if you reach for it again, God can give you back everything that you have lost. Woo! Woo! Huh. Huh. 16 months. Not one record, Doc. Not one record. 16 months. In Kings, Chronicles, Samuel, not one record did David ever pray while he was in Ziglag. Because the atmosphere of Ziglag is no praying, no praising, no worshiping, just church playing. So doctrine is not enough. Because you can believe doctrine and go to hell. I'm trying to be as kind as I can because I just got here. But I'm going to tell you something. Hell ought to be afraid of you. Hell ought to be afraid of you. You know, you, you didn't get it. I, I'm going to come down here. You can sit down. I'm coming down here to cheap seats. Here I come right now. You ready? The Bible said Elisha was staying at Dothan. And the king was trying to invade Israel. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. He's trying to invade Israel. You ready? Here's what it says. They're trying to invade Israel. So two times the prophet of the Lord said, don't go to such and such a place. Because that's where the king's trying to try to trap you. And the king saved himself twice. Now this is, I'm going to show you how stupid your enemy is and how smart your ally is. The king says, who's on their side? Somebody is, is blowing the beans here. Somebody's telling my plan. What's going on? And, and one of their own people says, not so. But they got a prophet in their camp. Isn't it a shame that unbelievers believe more about us than we do? Said they got a prophet in their camp, Elisha, and he hears what you say in your bedroom when you talk. And he said, that guy, watch, the heathen, the lost people, the ungodly people, believe in the operation of the supernatural, but the people of God don't. And he says, go, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Go find out and see where he is. Are you stupid? He just, he just avoided two invasions by you. You're going to sneak up on him? I got a wrench in my house, a big wrench like that, and it says you can't fix stupid. That's the God's truth. You can't fix stupid. And, and you got to understand something. This is so powerful. I, I, you're going to have to jump right now or I'm fixing to go home. You ready? Watch what he says. Go find out where he is. And they say, he's at Dothan. Watch what he does. He's at Dothan. Oh, okay. So the king comes, watch, with a great multitude, with thousands of chariots, horsemen, and spearmen. Ready for this? By night. I want to ask you a question, all you preachers. Who's afraid of who? Woo. I'm telling you. Hell is more afraid of you than you imagine. He knows that you're pregnant with possibility. And you're pregnant with power. And you're pregnant with promises. And if you can just get back what you've lost, you can, you can cause some great things to happen. Can, 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 I'm not going to preach to them no more. They just look. I'm going to preach to you. Sit down. You ready? I'm telling you. Who's afraid of who? See, what we need to do is we need to see ourselves like our enemy sees us. Amen. Amen. He's scared to death of you. You think I'm kidding you? Okay, we always make a big deal out of 3,000 on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 here when the law was given. Wait a minute. Yeah, what about the other one? All the years I've been preaching, I've never heard a holy roll that ever used the other 3,000. The Bible said... That Samson was knocking a fire out of all them morons. He was beating their brains in with a jawbone of a donkey. He was doing all kinds of stuff. And his, oh, I'm on the internet now. Okay, here we go. All his brethren came to him and said, 
don't you understand that the Philistines are lords over us? And I see Samson said, not over me, sucker. Over you, you little wussy, because you do have paid. No, no, no. He said, no, no. I, I got an anointing on me. He ain't lord over me. The Bible said they came to the rock Etam. And they came up and they said, No, it's not that these people are rulers over us. You're causing us a lot of trouble. See, that's what's happening in our movement. We are wanting to be politically acceptable. Wrong! We want all lost people to think good of us. Wrong! What we need to do is God to think good of us. God to be pleased with us. Let me tell you something, Bishop. You run this tick to... The highest thing that Pentecostals could ever do is do what Enoch did. I want to please God. Let me ask you, how long has it been since you really wanted to please God? I was praying in the motel this morning. I said, Lord, I want to be an asset, not a liability. I want to be a pleasure. I don't want to be a pain in the neck. I don't want you to look at me like you did in King Saul and said, it repents me that I ever made you king. I don't want God to ever look at me and say, I wish I'd have never called you to be a preacher. You turn out to be just a plastic jerk. The scripture in Hosea turns around and says, Israel has become a vessel wherein is no pleasure. Malachi chapter 1, he said, the Lord said to Israel, I have no pleasure in you. They are redeemed. They've been covenant people. What you're talking about, they're in covenant. They've been redeemed. But God says, I don't like hanging around you. I don't like your attitude. I don't like your spirit. I'm not going to bother with it. You see, listen to me. When God draws back from us, see, God fills all time and space. There's really no place he can go. All he does is withdraw his guidance. He just withdraws his protection. He just withdraws his provision. But he ain't gone nowhere. So, but, but he withdraws it because if we get... Now, I, I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings, but look, we got to stop being a people that dress funny and, and, and have long hair and pasty faces and sour pusses. And, and we got to stop being known for that. We've got to start being known for people who walk with God, who please God, who God answers their prayers. Now, I'm not a, you can sit down. I'm not, a, brother, I'm not a virgin voice up here. There's been times when I have lost things from God. Now, all you holy roll the Texas preachers, oh, it doesn't even apply to you. Well, it applied to me. I've lost the touch of God in my life because I let principles go. I let my prayer life dwindle. I, I, I let my financial sacrifice, submission, and support get worse than it should have been. And when I did that, once I let that go, I lost his smile. But once the Holy Ghost, can I help you with this? Don't get frustrated when God puts conviction on you. Conviction is the voice of love saying to you, you're better than that. Oh, I thank God for conviction. I thank God for times when he's woke me up at night and wouldn't let me sleep and said, come on, Jeffrey, you know you could be doing better than you're doing. And when I would repent and when I would come back, I got what I lost. I got a fresh gifting, a fresh anointing, a fresh drive, a fresh motivation. I don't have my watch, so I don't know what time it is. I'm going as fast as I can. I'm so sorry for, for just in, not doing better than I'm doing. I just, you, you got to get me three times it says in 1 Samuel, it says, and David recovered all. Now, I, I know this is a, the Bible school place here, but could you just tell me what part of that great theological word are you stumbling over? All. No, you, see, you didn't get it yet. God is wanting to give you back all that you've lost. God's wanting to give you back your dance. How long has it been since you danced? He wants to give you back your praise. He wants to give you back your hand clapping. He wants to give you back your monetary blessing to the kid. He, 
He wants to give you back peace that passes all understanding. He wants to give it back to you. You got to find out what did you leave that caused you to lose that. In all the years I've been preaching and pastoring, I, I've pastored people for 36 years in Gainesville. And, and um, uh, you know, I'm, we just got people like anybody else. But I pastored people for years who came to church with leaving on their mind. They come to church like this is a visit to the dentist office. Will this take long? Will it cost much? And how much will it hurt? Really? I, I, Pentecostals sometimes are baptized with a U-turn. Man, I, I came here to do business. I came here to interact with the one that brought me out of the hellhole and out of the honky top. I came here so that he would somehow restore my joy and restore my vision and restore my passion. I used to have that, and sometimes I've lost it. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm not doing very good, or, or you're not doing very good, one or the other. All you sweet people have got your buns super glued to the chair. You say, well, Brother Arnold, I'm not emotional. Liar, liar, pants on fire. What do you mean you're not emotional? You're selective with your emotion. Come on, you bunch of Texas cowboys. You got your pickup trucks with your guns hanging up there and your cowboy hats and your rattlesnake boots. And if you caught an eight-pound bass, you'd almost talk in tongues. Your wife buys that brand new dress. She comes walking into service. I got news for you, girl. Ain't nobody interested in you. You say, well, I'm not emotional. No, you are. You are emotional. You're just selective with it. We got a $69 million lottery in Florida. $69 million. That's for people who don't want to work. They play the lottery. Now, most of you people are too sanctified and too saved to buy a ticket. But you wouldn't mind your relative buying one in your name for a buck. Now, can you imagine, Brother Worley? Here you are. I mean, you got more money than Fort Knox. I know that. But can you imagine if, if tonight they called your wife and said, Mrs. Worley... This is such and such, 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 and do you live at such and such an address in Magnolia? Yes, I do. Now, your wife's got 400 pounds of cream on her face. She's got 200 rollers in her hair. She's in her underwear and her pajamas and her nightgown. And, and the guy turns around and he says, well, your number was just picked out of the Florida lottery, and you just won $69 million. Well, being a good Texas saint, here's how she responds. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Liar, liar, pants on fire. You give that chick $69 million, she'll come running down that stairs. She'll run out in front of the neighborhood. Ah! Woo! Yeah! The old man's going crazy. Honey, the neighbors, the neighbors said $69 million. I can buy all the new neighbors I want. I can care less about the neighbors. Are you ready? You have not won $69 million. You have won a trip to New Jerusalem. Where the Lamb is the light. Where there ain't no devil. And there ain't no disease. And there ain't no death. And you're going to see him. And you're going to have a brand new body. We need to go back to being excited about what we have received from the Lord. I need about five more minutes to preach, okay? Just five more minutes. I, I, I really felt like I, I needed to say something. said, we need to go back to what you left to get back what you lost. And I had a scripture I was going to use, but I knew it was running late. But it's a story. You can read it. It's your homework assignment. Luke chapter 2. The Bible said Joseph and Mary went up to the feast as was their annual thing. And when they were up there, Jesus was 12 years old. Watch this. And the Bible said they left him. So when you leave Jesus somewhere, you lose him. Now this is the only place I can find the Bible where it's sanctioned to go back. 
We always tell people, don't backslide, don't go back on God, don't go back in the world. Let me tell you something, baby. If you wake up one day and God is missing, go back. And the Bible said that they went all the way back to Jerusalem. Scripture says they were without Jesus for four days. Four days! They went one day out and thought he was among the friends. And fell. Could I help you with this? I don't care how spiritual, how dynamic your church is. You need to have God for yourself. You cannot have a relationship with God by proxy. You need to pray for yourself. You need to live in the spirit yourself. The church can't bail you out all the time. The preacher can't preach the greatest messages all the time. You just got to know God for yourself. And they went looking for Jesus everywhere, among the relatives and among the friends, and they couldn't find him. Couldn't find him. What a, boy, what a message that is, the power of supposition. Supposing that he had been among the relatives and the friends. And on the fourth day, they finally found him in the temple. That's where you always find him. They found him in the temple. And he was teaching those crazy, educated wackos who had more degrees than a thermometer. And he turns around and he's blowing their socks off with all his brilliance and all his wisdom. They said, son, why have you done this? We have sorrowed looking for you. He said, what are you looking for me for? Wished you not that I must be about my father's business? What, what, what's your problem? And they found what they had left. Let me ask you something. Be honest now. Come on. I know it's hard for Pentecostals to be honest. We're, we're, we're not transparent kind of people. Need to be honest. Have you lost something? And if you have, be honest and say, okay, do an inventory. Where did I leave? Now, he said it right the other night. There's nothing wrong with morality. There's nothing wrong with modesty. There's nothing wrong with separation. Now, now bear with me, Bishop. You're the big kahuna. Fine. I'm, I'm nothing in this movement. I'm just dirtbag Willie. Fine. Listen to me. I'm old. I'll be 75 in a few days. I'm old, okay? I came out of whorehouses and honky-tonks. I packed a gun. I robbed places. I was a bad boy. I came among you holy rollers. I thought you people were rejects from Barnum and Bailey Circus. I thought you folks were nuts, screaming and yelling and carrying on and slapping that oil on people's head and all that stuff. Then you wanted 10% of my money, and I, stupid enough, I gave it to you. And I stayed with this all this time. Here I am an old man now. Okay, you introduced an old man. I am an old man. I'm putting out a warning to the Pentecostal movement. We do not need to walk away from godliness or holiness or separation or righteous living or spirituality. There's a movement in the UPC that's scaring me that they want less of God. They, they want, they want the, the customer and the, and the worshiper to be accepted and they want them to be warm and fizzy. Fuzzy, I want to ask you what. What about pleasing God? What about whether God is pleased with the atmosphere in that service? Never mind about your sinner friend who's a dirtbag. Forget about that. I'm telling you what, if we get to living and worshiping and walking in the Spirit of God, it will attract people. It will draw people. It will not repel people from us. People are not repelled from the Spirit of God. They're repelled from fakery and falsehood. This world is tired of all that foolishness. They need to come into our churches and experience the presence of God. I'm, 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 I'm trying to get done. I'm trying to get done as best I can. Just bear with me just for a minute. You understand that Abraham was God's friend and he walked with God. Fine. But if you read Abraham's story, when you go to 12 and 13 of Genesis... Abraham left his trust in God because of the famine and because of the problem. And he goes down into Egypt and he lies to Pharaoh and says, uh, she's my sister. Now he's kind of stretching the truth. It's half sister, but he's stretching it. He said, save my buns, will you? Because I can't trust God with this. You know, it's a funny thing. I, I want to say this for headquarters. When I first got saved... Pentecostal people preached against taking insurance. Now, that was probably stupid, but now we sell it. Oops, I'll wait. 
I preached a message at a conference not too long ago, and I got so many people mad at me. I had emails, I had phone calls, I had letters. Here's what they said. Brother Arnold, if that message you preach about Obama and all that stuff ever gets to Washington, D.C., they will take away our tax-free status. I said, you hypocrite sucker, you. All you're in this for is so you can get a tax write-off? Let me ask you a question. Would you tithe and give if you didn't get a tax write-off? Is this normal for Texas? Is this the way it is? You remind me of the people I preach all these times that said, Oh, we've heard the rest and we heard you're the best. We've got our measuring tape out. Let's see. I'm not here for you. I'm here for them. I'm sorry for what problems you've gone through. I'm sorry for sorrows and hurts that you've gone through. But God wants to restore to you that level of spirituality and that level of joy. He wants to give you back what you've lost. But you've got to go back to what you've left. I, no, I, I, but please be, don't, don't, mis, don't, don't misinterpret me. I, I know we've got a lot of stuff going on now. We've got... Uh, services now we got we got uh, strobe lights and we got fog machines and we got funky rock music fine if that's what you want to do fine may I tell something to you old Bible man do you really think God is impressed with our programs and God is impressed with our buildings and God delights himself because we got money in the bank isn't he much happy with people that say I need you I'm hungry for you I love you. I, I'm not against money in the bank and buildings. And pro, but let me tell you something. That stuff can become a substitute for the substance of the Holy Ghost. I, I don't know what time it is. I'm going to stop. I, I, I was sure I had a much better message than I'm preaching. Don't you get it? When businesses start losing money, they go back to principles that they left. When ball teams start losing the game, they take a halftime break and they go back to what they were used to be doing. When marriages are floundering and they're losing that romance and that ecstasy of being married, if they're honest enough, they'll go back to principles that used to make their marriage work. If our churches are dead as... I hope to God your churches in Texas aren't as dead as this. This is scaring the fire out of me, man. I, I'll just tell you right now, I wouldn't even go to a church that didn't have a move of God. You laugh all you want to, but I ain't doing that. I'm not going, I'm not sitting next to some moron that's worried about how that shy is and how long his skirt is. And forget that trash. We need a move of God. We need God to turn around and just show up and shake this thing around and bust something. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. He established my goings. He put a song in my mouth. Even praise unto God. I got to praise God. I got to bust a move. I got to get excited. I'm trying to close for the last time. I didn't get my sermon preached. You don't have to pay me. I'm a multimillionaire. I'm a multimillionaire. Ask all the people that don't tithe. You ready? Come on. I used to play ball for the Air Force. I traveled all over the world playing ball. I was a football player, and I was a baseball player, and I could have been a professional ball player. I had a chance to play for the Kansas City A's and the Atlanta Braves, 1966, after Vietnam, and I came out and uh, get ready to go play ball, and you wackos were against it. I had to sell my golf club. Now, it's funny you suck because you all play golf. When I first got saved, you made me sell my golf clubs because that was like shooting pool on a big table. <laughs> Fine. So I had, to, I, had to, I had to get rid of my golf club. You made me sell my bowling ball because that was ungodly. I had to sell my catcher's mask. I had to sell my bat, gloves. I wasn't allowed to play sports. I wasn't doing anything. Now we got all kinds of intramural junk. Fine.
You ready? And because I love God, I'm still here. And I'm going to stay here. And I don't care what kind of craziness we come up with, it doesn't matter. Your business is not with UPC. Your business is with J-E-S-U-S. That's what your business is with. And if he's happy with you, nothing else matters. But if he's not happy with you, nothing else matters either. Turn and look at your neighbor real quick. I'm going to close. Turn around and say, I've lost something. But I'm going to find out where I left it. And I'm going to go back to what I left to get back what I lost. You see, the only reason David got back what he lost is because he went back to the God that he left. He stopped praying. He stopped worshiping. He stopped psalm writing. He stopped singing. When you leave God alone, he'll leave you alone. I had Brother Poe going to read these two scriptures. We probably don't have time. It's in Hosea. Here's what the Lord said in Hosea 5.15. I will return unto my place. Watch this. Till... In their affliction, they seek me. And in, my, in their affliction, they will seek me early and shall find me. Wow, what a message to preach. The till that brings triumph. God turned around and said, I'm withdrawing myself from you because of your stupidity. But, but I want to let you know something. Uh, I'll leave the door open. He said, I'm, I'm going to go till they acknowledge their sin and in their affliction they will seek me early. And then in 14 he says, okay, I will love them freely. I will bless them. I will increase them. Why? Because they've come back to me. That's always what God's complaint with Israel was. From your early days you have gone away from me. But now return unto me and I will return unto you. Let me say this and I close. The immutability of God guarantees the performance of His promise. Because God cannot change, the promise is guaranteed. But it is your pursuit that lets you experience the promise. And if you're not willing to pursue it, you don't experience it. Okay, come on, do something now. I'm finished. Do something now. Hey, Bishop. King Saul lost God's voice, lost God's protection, lost God's provision. Why? He left God when he became disobedient and rebellious. When we leave God and his principles, we lose God. Now, not that God goes anywhere. He fills all time and space. He can't go no place. But he just withdraws his influence. You know, I hope I'm not being disrespectful to the Lord. Are you people snoring? No, you're not snoring, right? Okay. You just always look like that, so excited. Okay, you, you ready? I've said for 30 years, God is the original Burger King. You say, really? Yeah. Here's what Burger King's cliche was. We'll let you have it your way. So now it's up to you. You can let, God will let you have it your way. Or you can turn around and come back to God. Remember how excited you were when you first got saved? Remember how thrilled you were when you first came into the church? Why don't we ask God to restore that level unto us right now? Come on, could we? We ready? We're going to sing? We're going to do something? I'm, I'm sorry I didn't preach better. Don't buy the tape. Do something else. That's fine. But I'm here to tell you, I feel like I had a word from God. God wants to tell you if you've lost something... Go back to where you left it. Go back to where you... When that man lost that axe head, the prophet said, where did it fall? Show me where you left it, and I'll help you to recover it. Come on. Have you left your dedication? Have you left your submission? Have you left your surrender? Have you left your thirsting? Have you left your hungering for the things of God? from you, Lord. Oh, but still I hear you calling me. Those simple things that I once knew. Oh, those 
those memories are drawing me. Oh, I must confess, Lord, I've been blessed. Oh, and yet my soul's not satisfied. So renew my faith. Come on. Restore Come on. my joy. If my people, which are called by my name, oh, and to, to humble my themselves and pray, eyes, seek and my I faith, pray, turn Lord, from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. Lord, I'll forgive their sin. I'll heal their land. If my people will, I will. To the place where I oh, oh, take me back. Oh, take me back. Oh, where I, where I first oh, oh, take me back. I want to go back, Lord. Take me back, Jesus. Take me back, Jesus. To the place. that I'm so 